I'm Francis Durnley, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, further to news from the front lines, we discuss news of cutting-edge air defence systems being sent to Kyiv, assess the current strategic picture on the ground, and analyse the threat of blackouts as Moscow increases its bombardments on Ukraine's energy infrastructure. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. If we give President Zelensky the tools, the Ukrainians will finish the job. Slava Ukraini! Nobody is going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. It's Wednesday, the 12th of June, two years and 110 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today I'm joined by our Associate Editor of Defence, Dominic Nichols, and live from the Ukraine Recovery Conference in Berlin, Lilian Bivings of the Kyiv Independent. I started by asking Dom, however, for the latest news from the battlefield. Well, hi, Francis. Uh, welcome, Lilian, and, uh, and hi to you, wherever you are. So let's start off today. There's been uh, an attack, air raid attack on, on Kyiv. It's just finished in the last few minutes, we think. Missiles and drones, Ukrainian military are saying. Uh, Ukraine's air defence systems or air defence forces say they destroyed all munitions heading towards the city. This comes from Sergei Popko, the head of Kyiv's military administration, speaking on Telegram. Uh, he said Russia had used a combination of cruise and ballistic missiles as well as drones. No reports yet of any casualties elsewhere in Kyiv Oblast or elsewhere across the country. So we'll keep our eyes on that. Separately, Ukraine's military said, uh, well, what, the second time in three days? It said it had hit three Russian surface-to-air missile systems in Crimea last night. The second, as I say, the second one of those numbers this week strikes again targeted an S-300 and two S-400 air defence systems, including the radars near Belbek and and Sevastopol this time. This comes from Ukraine's general staff in their update this morning. On a a note in Telegram, general staff said, as a result of the strikes, two radars of the S-300 and S-400 complexes were destroyed. Information about the third radar, as in the radar for for the second S-400 system, is being clarified. I said again, as I said yesterday, and I hopefully will say again, why Russia has not got short-range air defence to protect these very, very sophisticated pieces of equipment, I do not know. Although a hint came yesterday as we were discussing, there's a suggestion that they've had to pull their systems out to protect Belgorod and some of the the border regions there inside Russia, two and a half years after a three-day lightning offensive, and they're having to pull out of Crimea to defend Russia itself. Incredible, incredible. Now, next one. UK Defence Intelligence in their daily intelligence update today say that there's heavy fighting in the vicinity of Chasiv Yar. So we're down in the Donetsk, or just north of Donetsk City, northwest of the city now in the Donbass. They say there's been a very a limited Russian break-in in the eastern suburbs. Now, the city of Chasiv Yar, it's shaped almost like an, like an F, like a capital F, if you like. But the middle bar of the F is, is really quite stubby, like a sort of, I know, Tyrannosaurus arms type thing. So it's there, but it's not very big. So the long bit across the top, the easternmost 20% of that is what we think is in now in Russia's hands. So the rest of the F, if you like, the rest of Chasiv Yar is still held by uh, Ukrainian forces. Uh, and importantly, that the bit they have taken is what's on the east side of a canal that runs north-south through the area. And it's very, very difficult to get across a, a water obstacle like that. So that will naturally provide some form of, of defence. However, so where are we? We're about 8 k's west of Bakhmut. UK defence intelligence say that Russia are taking heavy casualties, as expected, because they seem to be using their old tactics of heavily artillery-led infantry running at the Ukrainian positions. You know, the tactic has got the nomenclature of meat assaults just running at the enemy. Thermobaric weapons are said to be used, the sort of fuel-air explosive mix. This is coming from Ukraine's air force, Ukraine, sorry, Ukraine's uh, armed forces, the general staff. British defence intelligence also think that Russia has taken control of Ivaniska, that's a village to the southwest of Chasiv Yar. But uh, it's a limited gains there. They've obviously been pushing at the door of Chasiv Yar for, for months. There was some talk that they wanted to take it before the May the 9th uh, victory to, uh, parade in Moscow to have something to celebrate. That 
clearly hasn't happened. So it is slow going and at uh, and at very heavy cost. And to give an idea of the cost, Ukrainian military officials said this morning that Russia has lost another 980 troops yesterday across the front line. The general staff said over the past day the Russians lost 980 servicemen killed and wounded, nine tanks and 40, 46 artillery systems. They say that takes the total number of casualties killed and wounded, for which I think I mean we in the West would include, if you talk about casualties, we would include prisoners of war and, and those that are missing. But obviously out of those four for um, groups killed and wounded are by far the, the heaviest. So I'm probably splitting hairs, but just trying to give you the, the sort of accuracy about how different countries do different things. But Ukraine's armed forces say that um, since the full-scale invasion launched, the Russian killed and wounded now numbers over 520,000. Over the months, the Western officials have come to come to say that, uh, or come to accept that, that Ukraine's casualty figures or the figures they report are largely they would agree with them largely ac- accurate it's very difficult to get accuracy in this kind of situation but they say they're not they don't believe they are heavily conflated for sort of propaganda purposes so ukraine saying 500 well 521,830 is what they're saying this morning so take a smidge off that if you like 10 percent. that's probably about the ballpark figure Now, next, Norway says it's going to contribute 240 million euros in air defence systems for Ukraine. They've announced this morning the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for Norway said that Germany has confirmed that it, together with Norway, Denmark and the Netherlands, will finance the re-procurement of a Patriot system so that 100 Patriot missiles can be quickly donated to Ukraine. Norway is going to contribute 125 million euro to that cooperation. That comes on the back of the United States saying that it's going to send another whole missile, Patriot missile system, which of course includes the launchers, the radar, the control system and the missiles themselves. So the, the, the US providing 1.1 billion US dollars worth of system, one, one Patriot system to Ukraine in the coming days. That's thought to be the second the US has, has sent to Ukraine. We're not entirely sure. I mean, they are very signature pieces of piece of equipment. We think, well, Pentagon re- officials refuse to talk about how many they've got. But one senior military official speaking recently said the army had only deployed 14 systems in the US and around the world. So if they've donated two to Ukraine, that is a significant number from their arsenal. But um, as I say, the system as a whole is the four parts, the the launcher, the controller, the radar and the missiles. So the US supplying one whole system and that uh, the air defence measure announced by Norway is for the missiles, it looks like. But everything, it all adds up, as they say. Now, I think just one more, two more, sorry, two more for me. NATO Sec General Jens Stoltenberg, he's in Hungary today speaking to Prime Minister Viktor Orban in Budapest. This is in advance or um, discussing preparations for the Washington summit, the NATO summit in July, second week of July in Washington, at which the uh, the next NATO Sec Gen is, is expected to be announced. Mr. Stoltenberg commended Hungary's commitment to alliance security, including its leadership of a NATO multinational battle group and its hosting of a military headquarters. And he also gave them a thumbs up for their contributions to the K4 peacekeeping mission in Kosovo, the Kosovo force. He also welcomed that since the start of the, of the full-scale invasion, Hungary has provided shelter for Ukrainian refugees and helped rehabilitate wounded Ukrainian soldiers. So that's Mr. Soltenberg's ear-stroking efforts there. But in a press conference that's just finished, Viktor Orban said that Hungary is not going to join NATO's planned next steps in support of Ukraine. But importantly, and this is the important bit, it's not going to stand in the way of them either. Now, Viktor Orban has repeatedly opposed Ukraine joining NATO and the EU. He's opposed sanctions on Russia. He's undermined Western aid efforts for Ukraine. He's maintained close relations with Moscow since the full scale start of the full scale invasion. And when he was speaking to the news conference, Mr. Orban said Hungary made clear today that it will not block decisions by NATO. (laughs) Here we go. Um, (laughs) I I do like this sentence. Hungary made clear today 
that it will not block decisions by NATO which, although they differ from our rational assessment of the situation, are shared and advocated by the rest of the alliance. Fine. So he gets his dig in there, basically saying it's irrational, but he's not going to stand in the way, which is the important, the important bit. He added that he had received assurances from Mr. Stoltenberg that Hungary would not have to provide funding for Ukraine or send any personnel there. And I've just seen a clip of the um, of the press conference with uh, Jens Stoltenberg saying that the alliance, the collective bit about the alliance is Article 5, an attack on one is an attack on all. That doesn't mean that the alliance does everything together all the time. So putting together a support package for Ukraine, he says it's perfectly acceptable for some uh, alliance members to step back and say this, this one's not for us. So I think that is a, about as good an accommodation as you can get between um, between uh, NATO and Hungary. be interesting to see what messaging comes out when Mr. Stoltenberg leaves Budapest, if any. But I think that's that's a practical accommodation. Uh, and just finally, Finland has made its first deployment since joining NATO in uh, April this year, the 31st member to do so, I think. Was it was Sweden? No, they were 31, 31, Sweden 32. So they've sent seven F-18 fighter jets to a military base in southeastern Romania where they're going to take part alongside British jets they're going to they're going to run the NATO Black Sea Air Policing mission for the next I think these things are normally 4 months in duration and what else is there Finnish Air Force commander said the mission would would help speed up Finland's integration into NATO this is Johan Antia commander of Finland's Karelia Air Wing told soldiers on the tarmac at a Romanian air base I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce he said I'm sure that during this enhanced air policing shielding mission our integration into NATO will take a big leap forward we as a team will have learned a lot and all this will be will boost NATO deterrence and defence you'll remember that I mean it's great to have Finland in NATO but but importantly it uh, it doubled the length of the border that NATO now has with Russia which you know if you listen to Russia when they say they're being surrounded by NATO that's not entirely true even though with Finland on board it now takes the border NATO's border with Russia up to two and a half thousand kilometers half of that is is Finland so two and a half thousand kilometers still only accounts for 11 percent of Russia's external border so I don't think you can count that as being surrounded but uh, I don't know, I'll leave that up to you. Your interpretation, what do you, what do you think about that? And that's us up to date, Francis. Well, thanks very much, Dom. Obviously, I'll get to the major political updates in the moment. But the big story where a lot of the world is watching at the moment is, of course, Berlin, where, as listeners will know from yesterday's episode, the Ukraine Recovery Conference dedicated to the long-term reconstruction of the country is currently taking place in Berlin, attended by upwards of 10 prime ministers. President Zelensky gave his opening remarks yesterday and Lillian Beavings from the Kiev Independent is actually there. So we're delighted to be joined by her again. Lillian, first of all, after Zelensky and Schultz's speeches yesterday, what was happening at the conference? Hi, everyone. Thanks for for having me back on. The conference was quite busy. I mean, there were lots of panels and events and different press conferences and different announcements being made. And of course, lots of memorandums of understanding being signed, lots of support, further support for Ukraine being announced, especially in terms of funds for repairing the country's energy infrastructure that is constantly being attacked by Russia, how to uh, further economic ties between the countries and, and develop business between the countries and investment between various countries in, in Europe and, and Ukraine. But I think the, the main thing that everybody was really focused on and talking about, even at every single different press conference or panel or event was the attacks on Ukraine's energy infrastructure and the damage to Ukraine's energy system. That is very frightening. Thank you. And uh, I'm very interested, Leanne, in what the general mood is like there at the moment. I mean, the remarks from President Zelensky, as one would expect yesterday, were punchy and there have been more commitments that have been made. But what's the general atmosphere like there? Is it pessimistic? Is there a sense of optimism? Just a general sense of the atmosphere would be interesting. And also the kind of people that you're bumping into there would also be fascinating. Yeah, so the general atmosphere, I have to say, there's two big things that are overshadowing, that hanging over the entire event. And 
first of all, it's a recovery conference. It's about Ukraine's reconstruction. But I think everybody at this point has come to terms with the fact that we can't really talk about Ukraine's reconstruction when the war is still so much in a hot phase and still ongoing. And Ukraine needs support to actually win the war, right? And things are not great on the battlefield right now. And the attacks are happening every single day, just like what happened last night in Ukraine. And so the first thing hanging over the whole conference is this idea that, okay, we can't really even like discuss reconstruction when the, the emergency situation is repairing Ukraine's energy infrastructure before winter, which of course, like as all of the different ministers and, and Ukrainian officials and, and people who are here at the conference are saying is the absolute first priority of the country. But of course, the actual priority really is securing more air defense, right? It's not just about repairing energy infrastructure because you can repair it as much as you want. If you don't have the air defense to protect it, it's all in vain, right? So that's really the one cloud hanging over everything is this idea that, okay, there's recovery and reconstruction, but we can't even really talk about that yet. And the other big thing that's hanging over the whole event is the fact that the day before the conference started on Monday, so the day before it started on yesterday, but on Monday, Ukraine's Minister for Recovery, Mustafa Naim, resigned, uh, basically saying that his agency was constantly being undermined by the government, by the Zelensky administration. So you have the recovery conference starting on Tuesday with the recovery minister quitting on Monday, right? So this is all, and everybody's thinking like, well, okay, so we're having this big conference about this and the country doesn't even have a person in charge of this, right? So it's not a great look, it's a bit concerning. It's also a signal like how serious is recovery for Ukraine at this moment if they're not really cooperating well with the, that ministry and with that minister so, so much to the, to the point that he he wanted to quit. And I think it's true though, right? That like all the things I was saying before, recovery is not the main priority right now. The main priority is securing air defense so that the country can protect its energy infrastructure and what that means is actually have industries operating and people living and people staying in Ukraine and the economy going and actually getting to a point where the country can be secure enough that might attract real investment. Because that's the thing. I mean, people talk about investing in Ukraine a lot and there's lots of announcements of international financial institutions and governments putting money into Ukraine. But the idea of the private sector really coming into Ukraine in earnest and investing, it's not really happening yet. So those are the two things, like that's the atmosphere. That's really what everybody's talking about, right? And that's what everyone really knows is actually... The thing in terms of people that are at the event and that I'm bumping into, I mean, I've been mostly talking to people about energy because that's the thing that I, I mean, it's not just that I think is the most important. I think it is the most important thing. So I was talking to people both from private energy companies and also Ukraine state-owned energy companies like Naftagas and things like that, and also people that work in that sphere of energy and climate. So that was who I was bumping into. But you saw a lot of people from, it's interesting, You, I would say that a lot of the people that were there were from... Ukrainian, they were Ukrainian officials from ministries, from different agencies. Same with the German representatives. You have a lot of people from the government here. So I would say that, and then you had, you did have businesses that were present at the sort of pavilion area, defense companies for sure, right? And then you had the municipalities, you know, Ukraine's uh, cities and uh, regions and things like that. They were represented, discussing on ways of kind of furthering cooperation between German municipalities and Ukrainian ones, because of course, one of the themes too was like, is decentralization of the energy system, so it's not as centralized and subject to attacks, but also development and reconstruction and modernization of Ukraine's cities, municipalities, and really putting the onus on local communities to, to rebuild and modernize and things like that. So I would say, like, I think to me, it seemed like it was very, even though one of the topics was about pri the private sector and private sector investment, I would say that it was pretty heavy on the kind of government official level, uh, which was to be expected. But uh, I think the, <laughs> what I, the conclusion I draw from that, right, is just that like, we're not at the point yet to really talk about large scale private sector investment in, in Ukraine, because private sector investors are generally, they're, they're risk averse. I mean, even if they're into taking riskier bets, this is, you know, investing in Ukraine is an extremely risky one, right? So, so yeah, that would be my overall feeling of what was going on these last couple of days. Thank you. That's really interesting. And if I may just ask one more question before we go into the other political updates, there will be chatting again with you later on just a little bit more about the energy front and blackouts particularly, is if you were being critical of this conference, what might you 
say about the feasibility, for instance, the effectiveness of the commitments that are being made there? Is there a sense of progress since last year's Congress or is it a little bit of a talking shop, do you think? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think all of these events are a little bit of that, but they're really important. Someone I, I spoke with someone before the event that I did an, uh, an interview with, Alexei Rapchin. He's a political consultant now, but he was a former lawmaker in Ukraine. And he was saying one of the things that's really important about these conferences is the networking, obviously, right? I think that's actually what they're for, right? It's about the informal discussions, the side events, the side conversations. That's what they're really about. And he said, particularly when we're talking about EU integration, because there's lots of EU officials there, Ukrainian officials come, they talk to them and meet them. And they have coffee with them and they spend time with them and have informal discussions and honest discussions. And it's not just important for right now, the moment in Ukraine. Like These are the people, I thought this was really interesting when he said, these are the people that Ukrainians are going to be working with for years on Ukraine's EU accession, which is presumably going to start. I mean, that the sort of negotiations are going to start this year. And it's really important that they that these people know each other personally. So I thought that was really interesting, right? Because, of course these things, there's lots of big announcements made and they're great and there's lots of support for Ukraine and things like that. But at the end of the day, that's what this is really about. And I hadn't thought about it in terms of the EU integration of getting to know these people that, yes, they're going to be communicating with for five, six, seven years, as long as it takes for Ukraine to join the European Union. But I'll put it this way. There was a press, there was a energy minister, Ukraine's energy minister, Herman Haloshenko, was giving a bit uh, a speech yesterday and he said thank you for all the support for the millions and billions of, of you know dollars to to help repair our energy infrastructure and we appreciate the support but it's just it's not enough like it's just simply like in, in terms of the amount of money it's not enough but also the amount of air defense support that's coming in for Ukraine like it's just we need more like we need more of your help and so I think it's important that this many people are still showing up and showing their support for Ukraine, that this amount of money is still being pledged for Ukraine. But like the minister said, it's still just, it's not enough. And for me, the main takeaway or criticism that I have is like, we're talking a lot about, like, this is a recovery conference, but we have to talk about Ukraine's need for air defense so it can rebuild, repair this energy, or sorry, air defense so it can protect energy infrastructure. And you're thinking like, I don't, like all of this money that's being pledged, right? It's like, wouldn't it, in the long run, it's going to cost these international financial institutions and countries and governments more money if they have to pour billions into repairing infrastructure that simply wouldn't be damaged if it was protected properly by air defenses that these same countries could provide. So it's like, I'm sitting here at the conference just like, what is happening? Why? You're just like trying to do the math and you're like, if the air defenses were there, they they would shoot down the missiles that are attacking this infrastructure that then these countries have to give money to repair. I mean, there's a direct correlation. So yeah, I think that's my main criticism is it seems a bit uh, all in vain almost, some of these commitments because, or not in vain, but that there's a pretty simple solution to not having to pledge this much money. Of course, they, they need, the money needs to be put in now and, and repair the infrastructure now, but if Ukraine had the proper air defenses, they, they wouldn't have to. So yeah, that's the, the main thing on my mind and the main criticism of this this whole event. Well, thank you very much, Liliana. So we'll come back to you later to talk a little bit more about the issue of blackouts and, of course, very relevant as well to the patriot system that's being given by the United States, as Dom spoke about at the beginning. But just to first of all uh, have a look at the other major political updates of what's going on. Interestingly, let's stay on the energy front. The British Foreign Secretary has gone in hard on the ongoing issue of Russian oil and gas imports, whether direct or indirect purchases, calling for a halt on all imports of Russian gas in a veiled jab, of course, at France, Belgium and Spain. So Lord Cameron said the West had to be as equally tough and precise, his words, in targeting Putin's revenue streams as Russians were being with strikes on Ukraine's energy infrastructure that we were just talking about. Quote, we know what Russia has tried to do. They're trying to destroy the energy system, trying to take coking coal that is crucial for Ukraine's iron and steel industry and trying to destroy the gas storages in Ukraine. They're going with toughness and precision after Ukraine's key assets. And we have to ask ourselves, are we being equally tough and precise ourselves? We have rightly switched off a lot of Russian oil, but it's time to make sure we totally switch off Russian gas into Europe 
as well. Now, in 2023, we, The Telegraph, revealed that the EU countries had quietly channeled more than 6.1 billion euros into Russia's coffers through the purchase of liquefied natural gas over 11 months. Brussels has pledged to end its use of Russian fossil fuels by 2027 and has introduced sanctions against imports of oil and coal. But it has been unable to agree on a plan to introduce punitive measures against gas exports from Moscow because of member state opposition. The European Commission has drawn up plans to ban EU ports from reselling Russian LNG as part of a 14th package of sanctions. That move would come as a serious blow to Russia because European ports act as a convenient layover. Without them, Moscow would have to use icebreaker vessels to cut new shipping routes through the Arctic ice to get to Asia. So a lot going on in this space at the moment. And of course, the major question is whether it is really possible to totally enforce sanctions. We've, of course, talked extensively in recent months about the challenges faced by countries trying to impose and enforce sanctions, particularly because of third countries. Now, staying on the subject of sanctions, the US government plans today to announce wider restrictions on the sale of semiconductor chips and other goods to Russia with the goal of targeting those third party sellers in countries like China. That's coming from sources familiar with the plans. Those moves, as I say, are part of a push more widely by the Biden administration and others to respond to Russia's efforts to dodge the sanctions and stifle the war effort now by trying to find third parties that can then funnel it in through other means. That huge evasion is seeing certain countries in Central Asia now suddenly importing a thousand percent more of certain parts. So it just speaks to quite how much evasion is really going on. Now, of course, it's incredibly challenging to enforce sanctions, not only because of the way that the market works in trying to find alternative ways in, but also when countries like China resolutely oppose all unilateral sanctions, which is what they're saying today following new warnings from the G7 countries on small Chinese banks concerning their ties to Russia. So a spokesman for the Chinese government said it will take all necessary measures to firmly safeguard the legitimate rights and interests of Chinese enterprises after it was reported that member countries of the G7 were set to send a tough new warning next, next week to smaller Chinese banks to stop assisting Russia in evading Western sanctions. The leaders are gathering for the summit from tomorrow, June 13th to Saturday the 15th. And as part of that, it's expected them to make a rebuke, which usually comes in the days afterwards once the discussions have taken place. Hence what I was saying next week earlier. So, yes, lots going on there. But as Don was saying earlier on, obstructivism isn't happening everywhere. I think that those remarks from Hungary are interesting on the fact that it's not going to stop the support of Ukraine. There were, of course, extreme concerns earlier on in the year that Hungary might well double down and block some of the punitive measures that were being made by NATO and indeed measures more broadly that NATO was trying to do in order to support Ukraine. But evidently, the conversations happening in the back channels have not succeeded. I think the next debate, of course, will be about whether some Western troops on the ground, whether under the banner of NATO or not, would be a possibility in worst case scenarios. Although I do wonder, actually, whether the worst case scenarios are actually likely at all now. And that's something I want to put to Dom in a moment. If you just bear with me, I just want to talk about one more um, update uh, before I do that, which is we discussed hybrid warfare extensively yesterday following the remarks of the Czech Prime Minister about his concerns. And what's interesting is that the presidents of Romania, Poland and Latvia said yesterday in a statement released to coincide with a meeting of the Eastern members of the alliance that Russia is using tactics ranging from sabotage and cyber attacks to illegal migration to destabilise them directly because of their support for Ukraine. So I'll just read an extract from the statement. We are deeply concerned about Russia's recent malignant hybrid activities on allied territory, which constitute a threat to our security. We will act individually and collectively to address these concerns, boost our resilience and continue to coordinate closely to ensure that the alliance and allies are prepared to deter and defend 
against hybrid actions or attacks. And indeed, the Polish Prime Minister Donald Tusk said on a, just after our broadcast that 10 people have been arrested in Poland in recent weeks for acts of sabotage. And I imagine that many of those will be foreign nationals following the new blueprint that Moscow seems to be following in how it coordinates these attacks, recruiting people from other countries, and then they have, of course, plausible deniability. So that's where we are in terms of the political updates. As I say, before we go back to Liliane, I just want to go back to you, Dom, and I'm putting myself on the block here, potentially, but I've written a piece for the paper today, and I'll add a link in the description to the episode if you'd like to read it. And its thesis is what some may find rather controversial. And the reason I've written it is I want to stir that debate and at least put the question forward now, which is that given the major shifts in Washington's position on the war in recent weeks, of course, the green lighting of weapons uh, to be able to attack Russian soil around the Kharkiv front, as well as the weapons starting to filter through, starting to filter through, I, I would stress that perhaps the worst case scenarios of a major Russian breakthrough have now passed, that we're no longer in that position. And therefore, Putin has missed his opportunity to score a decisive military victory before the American presidential election in November. In recent days alone, as we've talked about on the podcast, the permission to allow advanced missile strikes are paying dividends. And taken in isolation, it may be that some of these things don't seem to mark a huge shift in the position on the ground, which of course is precarious from Kiev's position. But taken together, when you start to combine them all, I think there is a picture emerging here that the, it's having an effect. I mean, one strike last week alone is estimated to have destroyed $540 million worth of Russian oil. So it's just an example of the kind of resources that Russia is hemorrhaging as a result of not only the strikes around Kharkiv, but also because those strikes have been permitted there. That's freed up the missiles that they were having to use there, that they had the permission to use, that they can now use elsewhere and be able to strike even deeper into Russia, even if they are not the weapons that America has given them permission to use. So it's an interesting picture. In short, the thesis that I'm putting forward is that perhaps the critical window of opportunity where Moscow outmanned and outgunned Kiev has passed, potentially, coming at a very heavy price for Putin politically as we approach November. His aim was, of course, to make substantive inroads before America went to the polls, embarrassing Biden and obliging whoever won the White House to force Kyiv into peace talks. Instead, he now faces frozen front lines, which will embolden the West to continue and expand its support. And of course, that's before one even gets into the extortionate losses that Dom spoke about earlier on. So perhaps it is time to reassess the period following Ukraine's failed counteroffensive last year. Rather than just focusing on Russia making incremental gains, it should be seen as a highly effective Ukrainian defence and potentially decisive military operation, as far as they are concerned, in holding the line whilst waiting for things to change politically and waiting for things to change militarily as those vital supplies arrived. So that's my thesis. It's injecting, I hope, a little bit of optimism. As I say, I'd highly recommend that listeners read it out, if only to lambast me, and we'll add a link in. But, Don, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, thanks, Francis. Yeah, I found I found it very uh, very useful, very, actually a very useful addition, and not just for mopping up the, the tea spill over my desk, but it was it just in and of itself, it was quite, it was it was moderately helpful. But I think the idea is 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 along the right tracks, and this idea that all wars end most wars end by negotiation. So the chances of Putin achieving his maximalist aims, which he still holds, i.e. to take the entire country, that's what he still wants to do, the whole uh, Ruski Mir, the whole the, the whole Russia, regaining um, what he sees as the Russian Empire and the sphere of influence and all that kind of stuff. He still, he still wants that. Um, equally, Ukraine's position of trying to, or wanting to eject every single Russian soldier from Ukrainian soil okay that maximalist position I don't think either of those are are achievable um, so I think this war is going to end somehow at some point through a negotiation so so what happens in between now and then and in whose advantage is it to negotiate now or negotiate later so who is winning the war of time the time on time is on whose side right so at the moment you I think you're right I think we're com- just coming out of the window 
where time has been on Putin's side. I think it still is. I think for the rest of this year, at least, it, it will be. I think uh, because it's taking time for the collective West to an external support, you know, shorthand for external supporters of Ukraine to get their their act, in, act together in terms of the hard military pledges, the financial pledges and policy pledges. So it's taking a while. This happens. Consensus takes time in a democracy. Have multiple democracies in there, then it's going to take even longer. And that's what we've seen. But it seems to be coming around now in terms of so red lines have been what we thought were red lines, if even if we were self deterring, have been crossed. So, first of all, we weren't going to supply tanks. We supplied tanks. We weren't going to supply high Mars, attack them, these kind of long range precision kits, storm shadow. They weren't going to go. They went. So, various red lines have been punctured in terms of policy the long-range issue, the firing inside Russia issue, and in terms of economics. And I'll be very interested to hear Lilian's view on whether any chat at the recovery conference about using Russia's frozen assets. I know it's a very controversial area, but I, I understand there's a the, the idea of settling down to see it, see the fr- frozen Russian assets or the, the interest on them being used as down payments for any future reconstruction. So not quite the sort of the banditry highway robbery of just nicking stuff, but which is very controversial, but using it for a specific purpose to say that that money is going to recreate or rebuild that. So it's taken time, but the collective West is waking up. Now, I still think time is with Putin because he's got access to huge numbers of personnel. The losses are horrific, a thousand a day. And hat tip here to Martin for pointing out after... Our, um, our note about D-Day the last couple of days he said effectively Russia is going through an Omaha beach every three days that's the kind of number of personnel they are losing the Americans lost had about 3,000 killed and wounded on Omaha beach about 700 or 800 killed on day one so that's roughly what, what Russia's going through every three days so you know Putin is burning through his personnel. He's happy to do so at the moment because he's got a he's got a, a well of resource. We know that he's very reluctant to try and recruit from the major urban centres, Moscow, St. Petersburg and elsewhere. He's looking to the former Soviet republics. He's looking to, he's doing odd things with visas and passports. We saw yesterday the Indian government reporting that two Indian nationals have been killed in the military service of Russia. But he's still got personnel and he's got a very low moral bar at just shoving them forward uh, into these meat assaults. Equipment. He's still got a lot of equipment. Very old. The tanks are extremely old now. They haven't got any new optics, new protection, new weapons and communica- communication stuff. But they are still there. But these things won't last forever. He's got another few months, a year maybe, of, though, of quote unquote enjoying that largesse. But it is going to come to an end. I think towards the rest of this year, or certainly this winter, there's going to be another very concerted attack on or continued attacks into the winter against Ukraine's critical national infrastructure. And, of course, Putin is is holding out for the major um, democratic up, upheavals that are going to happen this year. You've got elections in Britain, in France, in the United States. So Putin's hoping that they are collectively going to see a major change in the West foreign policy strategy or, or, or just get us so bogged down in the treacle of new governments and, and domestic upheaval that that we just the the momentum of support for Ukraine comes to a halt. So he's that's what he's I think what he's got left in the locker, and he's coming out of the window of no pun intended for any oligarchs listening out there, but coming out of this window where where the time is on his side. Now, in terms of long term support. OK, he's got this deal, this friends with benefits thing with Russia um, and North Korea. But that is in one area alone. And it seems to be just in the, the hard military application. It's, no, it's not in terms of great political support. China's been quite muted on that. We think actually China quietly told him to tone down the nuclear rhetoric last year. Uh, which they seem to have done for a while, or he allowed his acolytes, the Medvedevs of the world, to to carry that bid on. But he's not getting huge political support. And in terms of what, what, just think about the Russia before, or what Russia wanted to get out of this. They wanted a lightning strike, take over Ukraine, and then go back to business as normal. And they may well have been right. If that happened in three weeks or two days, whatever they were hoping for, it may well have happened. The West may well have gone, oh, no. Oh, God, look what's happened. But you know, we've got to do business with these people and carry on. Of course, Nord Stream 2 hadn't been turned off at the start of the full-scale invasion. Don't forget. So I think a lot of the Russian elite, which could, if they got their collective acts together, 
could unseat Putin. Going to take a lot, but it could that could happen. That may be where the biggest threat to him comes from. So they were hoping that they would quickly go back to business as usual. They'd continue to send their kids to Oxford and Cambridge. They'd continue to go on holiday and own the villas in the south of France. They'd continue to go on holiday wherever they liked in the United States and to own property and assets and businesses abroad. Well, all that stopped, and it ain't going to come back anytime soon. And as one very senior uh, European official said to me earlier on today, nobody wants to send their kids to Pyongyang which is a fairly compelling argument. It was quite a neat little soundbite. But yeah, you can have as much strategic and military dialogue and partnership, but whatever, with North Korea. But you know, the, the elite aren't going aren't gonna to be rejoicing at that. So I think you're right, Francis. I, and for the, I'm never going to say that again. But yeah, I think you are right in your central thesis that at the moment, or well, he had his chance. He still has his chance, I think, for another few months, maybe a year. But unless something drastic happens... For Putin, I think the the collective West is waking up and getting its policy, its money, uh, and its and its peoples on side. And there's very few big cards left for Putin to play. He's, he's hoping for things to happen on the other side, hoping that these elections are going to are going to create uh, something for him. But that that's largely outside his control. I would expect there's huge disinformation and interference with all these all these elections. But actually. I think the the big parts are increasingly outside of Putin's control. He's he's slowly losing control, and he's he's on the downslope of that at the moment. Which, yeah, you know, I I on the one hand I think is is a, it's a glass half empty, glass half full. On the one hand, I think that's good because I think the the direction, the strategic direction of this war is going in Ukraine's favour. But what what happens next? What does a wounded, frightened, fearful Putin do? sat on the world's biggest nuclear arsenal if it becomes clear if the if you don't win the war on the battlefield you win and lose wars in people's minds and when putin realizes or decides that he has lost and he needs to make the best of what he's got left what does he do at that point so that you know conversation another day we've raised that before but i think right now yes i think your central argument as long-winded and as hackneyed as it was largely correct francis well done generous as ever dom if i could just come back on a couple of things a final thoughts on the, the, the piece and this debate is to stress I'm not trying to argue that this in any way means that the threat is passed that the turning point has, has necessarily been reached where weapons are funneling in that will be decisive I'm purely talking about the idea that the worst case scenarios may now no longer be in play by which I mean the seizure of vast swathes of territory and the collapse of the Ukrainian government, the Ukrainian armed forces, which, of course, may sound hypothetical now. But I remember a few weeks ago when there were very, very serious conversations taking place in the intelligence community that which was being shown to Mike Johnson and other senior figures about why, what the worst case scenarios might be. And it was that kind of Russian breakout. But I think that with the weapons permissions that have been given, the failure of the Kharkiv assault, the, um, uh, the weapons that are now beginning to, to funnel through to the front lines, the ammunition things letting up a bit, that the worst case scenario, the worst case scenario may now be passed. But that's still a very, very different uh, point than making that we are anywhere near a turning point in terms of Ukraine getting the momentum on its side. But even so, I think it's a debate worth our having. And just to stress too, I am not saying, of course, that there is not still enormous waves of frontline soldiers who are under equipped of course there are and we're still hearing from many soldiers that the ammunition situation is dire so i'm only saying that things are perhaps on a slight upward trajectory with things increasing hopefully in a positive direction in the weeks ahead but we're not there yet in terms of the promises and either way to your point dom i think that Things are out of Putin's hands, but things could go into his favour based on, even if he's not in control of them, if Donald Trump were to win the presidential election. I think there are, of course, major advantages for him of that, as things stand, given the stated positions of Donald Trump. Although, of course, that remains to be seen. He does seem to be malleable somewhat. And this will be something that ultimately, I think, still will rest in terms of the outcome of this war on Europe's shoulders. And there is still... I think, a hang-wringing in Europe at the moment about the best direction of travel, and those elections aren't helping that. It's not going to be a priority 
for a country to be having a long-term strategic military strategy when it's got elections that it's contending with. And that's true in Britain, that's true of the Euro elections, that's true of Paris, which is not only now going to have its own election again this year, but also it's got the Olympics, which is a huge national undertaking. So the eye can go off the ball, but I think ultimately this will rest on Europe's shoulders. But a fascinating discussion, I think, hopefully for us to be having now. And as I say, I very much welcome feedback from listeners to the piece and indeed to this argument that we've had today on this subject. And if you think I'm wrong, tell me so. This is about us really trying to flesh out what the likely outcomes and the situation is at the moment. But just before we wrap up for our final thoughts today, I just want to go back to Lillianne. Lillianne, we were talking earlier on about the energy front, which, as you say, is really vital as well here, as well as the military one. You've written a really interesting piece for the Kiev Independent on this issue of blackouts and how severe the energy situation is at the moment for Ukraine. I thought it was very interesting that President Zelensky focused on that quite extensively in his remarks at the recovery conference that you're at now uh, when he was speaking yesterday. So where are we exactly on this situation of blackouts at the moment? How serious is the threat in Ukraine? Yeah, I think the energy companies and officials have really started to sound the alarm on this because basically half of the country's energy capacity has been destroyed. And I think the the scariest thing, the kind of the human side of it, right, is that this means that this like potentially there could be 20 hours of blackouts a day, which is what I just what in the executive director of DTEC, Ukraine's largest private energy company, told me for the article. And that's the worst case scenario. And imagine like 20 hours of no power a day, no heat, right? I mean, that's like almost impossible to imagine. And he said, actually, the country is heading towards this worst case scenario. So like, this is a real possibility. If the financing doesn't come in to repair this infrastructure, and if the air defense is not there to then protect it. And I think why it's so important, it's not just about, I mean, first and foremost, it's about how much people will suffer in such a situation, right? Especially in winter. Um, But it's also about the fact that if you can't turn the lights on, you cannot produce weapons in factories in Ukraine that produce them. I mean, imagine, right? So it's this sort of total doomsday situation in which if you don't have energy, you can't produce the weapons that you need to get onto the battlefield to win this war, like to even fight the war, sorry, right? So it's critical. And and then it's not even that, right? Businesses can't operate. And we're not just talking about small and medium-sized enterprises and, and local businesses. We're talking about major metallurgical plants that will not be able to operate and export and contribute to the economy. So it's I think that's why Ukrainian officials, including Zelensky himself and energy companies, used this conference to really drive that message home because it's really bad, the situation. And um, actually, it was really interesting when this first started getting reported last week with unnamed officials putting this out there. And there was an article in the Financial Times. At first, the Ukrainian government came out and said, oh, it's, it's not as bad as those people are saying. But then the cat was out of the bag, right? And they had to just come forward and say, yeah, OK, it really is that bad, which I think is the better move, too, right? I think that's what the executive director of VTech told me. He's like, people need to know this. And it's not about panicking. It's about just actually, like, getting our act together and, and people, people, our partners abroad, like, doing something about it. That's really interesting. And we'll add a link to your analysis on the blackout situation in the show notes for this episode. Coming up, the final thoughts from Dom, Lian, and myself. It just comes for me to offer our final thoughts for today, or at least to come to that section of the episode, should I say. So Dom, let's start with you. Let's, what do you want to leave our listeners with today? Well, thanks, Francis. Just actually just a final thought on that, what we were just discussing there, that uh, I do think time is slowly becoming an asset for Ukraine. However, for the next few months at least, if not a year, we have to bear in mind that the Russian economy is still pumped up on steroids from defence spending. The whole the shift to, to, to a war footing. Shift, Putin shifted his economy to a war footing. That is that is going to have a it's a short a massive short term sugar rush for the Russian economy, and that's going to last for another few months. So they are producing stuff or trying to produce stuff like mad. They're struggling to get sophisticated microelectronics and circuit boards and all that kind of stuff. But at the moment, 
the the economy in terms of the defence spending and what that's doing for the economy is on a high. And to Lillian's point just now about about power cuts, I note today Ryan Mattel, the big uh, German arms manufacturer, has, has announced a deal with Ukraine to produce the Lynx infantry fighting vehicles, brand new German IFV, 30 mil cannon, pretty capable, it's only been out, well, not even 10 years yet, I don't think, going to produce that inside Ukraine. But as Lillian says, if you haven't got the power, then that, that's no good at all. It's just not it's just a piece of paper you've signed a contract on. So there are still many things in massively in Russia's favour and massively against Ukraine's against Ukraine's favour, not in Ukraine's favour, that speak of long term economic support and and endurance. And if this is a war of attrition, which I think it is now, then it's that long term industrial effort that is going to largely dictate how this thing ends. And still at the moment, for the next few months, I think that is in Russia's favour. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dom. Lillian, what are your final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's one interesting thing that I mean, it's that I want to drive home about this energy uh, crisis is that, like, I don't know if it's if it's even I don't even know how to put it. But it's so of the essence that companies and countries get as much air defense to Ukraine as possible. I know I've already mentioned that, and I know I'm repeating myself, but I think that's really where the pressure should be right now on countries. You know, and I just want to put it this way, like in the in the interview I did for the article, like the executive director of GTEC told me, he's like, look, we have the air defense systems that are positioned to protect the energy infrastructure. He's like, but there's no missiles inside of them. So we're just 10 missiles are approaching the thermal power plant and there's two missiles inside of the uh, air defense system. What good does that do anyone, right? So it's like we just have to watch basically as missiles hit critical infrastructure and we can't do anything about it. And so it's just, it's so much more important, I think, than anything else, because you can imagine if the city is actually, excuse me, if the country is actually protected by air defenses, then it can actually move forward a bit, develop. It can actually maybe attract some investment because places will be safe for investments. Right now, it's just not the case. And so, yes, Ukraine needs what it, it needs more weapons for the actual battlefield and for fighting Russia there. But in order for the countries that aren't on the front line, the parts of the country that are on the front line, they also need to be able to live safely so that the country can have a better economy. A better economy means more resources to, to fight and hopefully win the war. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To support our work and to stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, please subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk slash Ukraine the latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our foreign affairs newsletter, bringing stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine Live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. We also do the same for other breaking international stories. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do please refer to podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the Latest on your preferred podcast app and leave us a review as it really helps others find the show. Please also do share it with those who may not be aware we exist. As the disinformation war ramps up, we're relying on your support more than ever. You can get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do continue to read every message. You can also contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we're especially interested to hear where you're listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was today produced by Giles Gear and executive producers David Knowles and Louisa Wells. <laughs>